Well, welcome everyone. Um, we're absolutely uh, thrilled uh, to have uh, Administrator Fugate with us today. Uh, this is the uh, first time I think we've had, in recent memory, the FEMA administrator here. So it's a, it's a unique event for us. Andrew's saying first time probably ever. It's good. Um, and it's one of those events that gets a crowd like this. It's something we normally, it's an, an area we normally don't address at CSIS. But under um, um, the portfolio which I operate, and by, name, by the way, my name is Rick Ozzy Nelson, and I'm the director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program here at CSIS. The issue of disaster management um, and recovery um, is an issue that we're, uh, we're focusing on moving forward here. So we're, again, we're honored to have uh, Administrator Fugate here. Before we uh, move forward, I'd like to, uh, to thank a few people and, um, um, and introduce one person in particular. But uh, I want to thank our sponsors for this event, Louisiana State University, Mr. Joey Booth here in the front, and the uh, Pennington Foundation, uh, Ms. Lori Burtman, um, who's the CEO of that foundation, for their continued support for this. Um, this is a third event in a, a series we're having on disaster management. We had uh, Admiral Thad Allen in November. We had a, an extremely uh, successful event with um, on international cooperation in disaster management last month, and then next month we'll be um, looking at uh, public-private partnerships. We're hoping to have some CEOs or senior um, um, leaders from, from industry to talk about that. The series is designed, as with many things at CSIS, to provide a forum for government officials and academic experts and leaders uh, in the private industry to examine the critical issues such as preparedness and, and relief. I also want to uh, note that we have a, a special guest from, from Louisiana, uh, Mark Cooper, um, who's the, uh, the director of the Governor's Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness um, uh, effort down there. I had a chance in December to go down and see Mark and the operation they have there. And it's, uh, as, a, as a former DOD person, I get impressed by command centers. Um, and they have a, a quite an operation down there. And Mark, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for coming all the way up. Um, now on to our, our guest of honor here is um, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Craig Fugate. Um, I, I just spent, the first time I met him was today, and we spent uh, a couple of minutes in the back room, and uh, what an absolutely just uh, uh, a personal, personable uh, individual, and I'm so glad we're going to have him here. You know, based on that, this is going to be a little less on remarks and a lot on questions and answers per Mr. Fugate's um, request. Um, so we'll be doing that after I introduce uh, do some, we'll, he'll come up and give a couple of brief remarks, and then we'll go right into questions and answers. Um, I'll moderate those, and those of you know me, I run a tight ship, no statements and answers, questions and answers. But he really wants to have a dialogue and a discussion, so if you don't, you know, let's have a, a useful one. Um, be, be, be proactive in your questions, and, and let's try to have a, a, a get, get peel back the onion here to see exactly some of the changes that have been made under Administrator Fugate's um, uh, time at, at, at FEMA. Um, I, one, of the, um, he, one of the great things about him, I say he's kind of a strange fish here in Washington, D.C., because he's got a, a remarkable state and local experience, and he comes to federal government, which uh, is something that's um, you know, much needed. In fact, we were joking about uh, Civics 101. He says, I kind of touch on some of the nuances of physics, of Civics 101 in disaster management. I said, this whole town needs more Civics 101, so please, uh, we'll start with disaster management. But um, before coming to FEMA, um, he, was, uh, he has a career in, uh, in emergency management, volunteer firefighter, emergency paramedic, and a lieutenant, uh, is it the Alachua? Alachua. That's the Yank, that's the Yankee in me, sorry. Uh, Alachua County Fire and Rescue in Gainesville, Florida. Now we were trying to bet on whether he was gonna have an orange tie in, 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 response, in response to our Louisiana support, uh, state support here, but he, uh, he wore an Auburn tie instead. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so over the core, um, he also was appointed Bureau Chief of the, uh, for Preparedness and Response in 1997. And during his 12 years there, um, with the Florida Division of Emergency Management, um, of which he served director from 2001 to 2008. He managed some of the uh, largest disaster responses in Florida, uh, Florida history. In fact, uh, 2004, 2005, if you recall, there were a series of, uh, of hurricanes that um, proved very, very um, um, uh, super significant events, obviously, in Florida, and a great challenge to respond to. And then with Katrina, well, you know, obviously that didn't hit Florida directly. Um, it was also one of the largest, if not one of the largest state to state um, supports as far as aid to that region and helping recover um, Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, after his time uh, there, he also served as Chief of State Emergency Response Team 
managing numerous floods and, and tornadoes and other, all the other things that fall under that rubric. And then in 2009, he was appointed by President Obama uh, to come take over FEMA and provide a, a new strategic direction and, and move FEMA into the, to the next decade. So I will stop talking now. Again, uh, Mr. Fugate, thank you so much for, for, for being here. We'll do your, question, your uh, comments, and then we'll go right into questions and answers. Hi. Uh, we want to really leave time for some questions. So I wanted to tee something up. Generally, when you talk to FEMA, you're either of two minds. Either you think we are part of a national government and that FEMA runs disasters, in which case you don't really have any idea what we do. Or you take the approach that it's always about the reimbursement mechanisms under the Stafford Act and grants and dollars and how you rebuild. And I want to take a different path. I want to talk about something that my team actually named whole communities and people think this is like a brand new policy it isn't it's emergency management 101 it's getting outside and not looking at a regulatory framework of how do you respond to disasters and reimburse and stepping back and going how do disasters impact communities and what are the things that have to be built to be successful in meeting both the immediate needs but also starting that recovery we talk a lot about this in emergency management, and again, this is not FEMA-centric. This is me as a local, my practitioners and uh, my peers at the state and local level. Also, our peers in the private sector. We oftentimes forget that in the private sector, we have a large emergency management community as well as within the Department of Defense. So this is not something unique to just FEMA. It's the community of emergency managers. And so this talking about this whole community, I want to kind of break it down because it's not this big mysterious thing. It's not a new policy. It's just basic stuff, folks. We talk a lot about the public is a resource and not a liability. Now, this may seem like, well, what do you mean by that? It is the tendency that when a disaster strikes, we look at the public in a way that we got to do everything for them instead of looking at them as part of the team and a resource. We oftentimes talk at them. We don't carry on conversations with them. And we tend to make decisions for them as if they are not going to be doing anything until somebody shows up. Yet we know in large catastrophic disasters, the initial response is not even a local government response. It is oftentimes neighbors helping neighbors. As much as people talk about the search and rescue from the Coast Guard and Fish and Wildlife and others in Katrina, you know who was doing the first rescues? Boudreaux and their boat. Neighbors helping neighbors. Yet we tend to dismiss that because they don't have the incident command system training, they're not credentialed, you know, they're liability issues, and we tend to take away from what they bring. So the first thing is we look at is the public's not a liability, they're a resource. But the public has to understand they have responsibilities. They must prepare. This then gets turned into the critics of us saying, well, the reason they need to be prepared is because you're not going to help them, you can't get there, and you're abandoning your responsibilities to take care of everybody five seconds after the disaster happens. And I'm like going, well, if you thought that was going to happen, you got, uh, I can't help you. The reality is, in these very large-scale disasters, the reality is, if you optimize everything we do at all levels of government, you op optimize all the volunteers and NGOs, and you bring together everything that DOD does, we cannot get there fast enough. And here's what happens. People who don't prepare, because their assumption is somebody's going to take care of them, but had the resources and means to, cut in line. Guess who they cut in line in front of? The most vulnerable members of the community. The children and infants, the frail elderly, the poor. The people that should not have to get in line behind you because you didn't get ready. This isn't about we're not going to respond or help. It's about this is a shared responsibility. So if the public's a resource, they also have to understand there are responsibilities. They need to prepare to the best of their ability so we can focus our resources on the most vulnerable parts of the community. But we also need to recognize that if we look at the public as a resource, we also have to look at the private sector as part of the team. We have for too long done what I call government-centric problem solving. And it has the illusion of being very effective to the breaking point that we try to build our capabilities around what government can do and bring into a disaster. And guess what? In tornadoes and floods and other small compact disasters, it is very efficient, 
It falls into the illusion that government likes to have, which is control, bringing order to chaos and a disaster, and it's easy to manage. And if somebody wants to know what's being done, because it's all government, it's easier for us to say. But the reality is, on any given day, who provides the bulk of the food in your community? Private sector. They got the stores, they got the warehouses, they know the customers, and they were delivering it yesterday. But we always make the assumption when a disaster happens, they're not going to try to get their stores open. They're not going to have those resources there. And so you get some of the idiocy I got in Florida, which was we were so focused on what government was going to do, we started putting distribution points in the parking lots of open grocery stores. <laughs> it wasn't intentional. In 04, when the power went out, the grocery stores were closed. By 05, they realized that they couldn't afford their competitors getting open, so they were dragging generators in. They were bringing in circus tents. They were bringing in satellite phones, anything to get retailing. But we weren't part of the team. We operated what government was going to do with a blinder to the private sector, so we ended up going to the places that served the greatest number of people with the best highway access and the most parking. Gee, that's where they put those big stores at. <laughs> and they were open. Where should we have gone? Rural areas of my state that did not have those, inner city areas that do not have a present, those so-called food deserts, and door-to-door -door and high-rise retirement communities where there was no power and the elevators weren't working. But because we had all of our manpower and people focused on distribution to the bulk of the population without looking at the private sector as part of the team, we did not have the resources to do all that at once. So the business sector, private sector is part of this team. And then finally, FEMA's role in this is not one many people like to say. We're not in charge. In fact, if FEMA's in charge of anything, something's terribly wrong. You read our authorizing language, which we now have. Not only do we have the Stafford Act, which talks about how we administer financial reimbursement and direct federal assistance and coordinate federal programs, we now finally, for the first time, have authorizing language that says what FEMA's job is under the Homeland Security Act as amended by the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act. And you know what it tells us what FEMA's job is? FEMA's job is on behalf of the President and Secretary for Homeland Security to coordinate on behalf of them the federal resources in support of a governor or another lead federal agency. So, what was FEMA's role during the Gulf oil spill? What does the law say we do? We support. Who was the lead federal agency? Coast Guard. And we were supporting Admiral Allen with some of the things that he requested us to do. Why did FEMA go to Haiti? We have no authority there. Of course not. It wasn't a FEMA response. Who had the authority to respond to Haiti? USAID. The president told us we were all in. Guess what? We supported USAID. So if I leave you with nothing else before I stop, the public's a resource, not a liability. And we all have a responsibility to make sure that you're not getting in line in front of the most vulnerable citizens because you didn't get ready. Two, the private sector is part of the team. You can no longer approach the types of disasters we face on a large scale with a government-centric approach. And third, FEMA's not in charge, but we are authorized by Congress on behalf of the President, Secretary of Homeland Security to mobilize the federal family and the resources that we bring with Department of Defense and other parts of the federal government in support of a governor and a declared disaster or in support of another lead federal agency based upon their plans. So with that, we'll take questions. Thanks, Rick. I think you broke two records there. One was probably the, the, the shortest remarks in CSIS and probably the most substantive remarks in CSIS history. So, uh, um, so, so thank you for that. Um, we really appreciate those succinct remarks. So we'll go right, in, right into questions. Um, one of the things that uh, I'll start with the, the first question, if that's okay. One of the things uh, you, you talk about operational outcomes, not in this speech, but in other comments that you've made, and that's one of the priorities at FEMA under your leadership. And based on the comments you just said about achieving those three minors for the, for the people in the audience here and that are watching on, on the Internet, what are the two to three things that you're doing at FEMA that are going to get you there? What, where are your, what are your priorities? Well, part of this is um, we actually have, and I think one of the representatives back here from Big Locks joined us, we work with the uh, Retail Federation and, and some of the other, and we said, look, we cannot coordinate unless you're actually part of the team. And so we asked them, and they are providing on a rotating basis senior executives 
that joined the FEMA's team to help us coordinate with the private sector. So one example was during the recent ice storm, uh, there was a representative at that time, it was from Target, uh, but they were giving us and talking back and getting us updates on all of the major big box grocery stores and hardware stores and what their status was in the ice storm. So if we had to start providing assistance, we would have a better idea of what the private sector shortfalls were going to be. Previously, FEMA had no way to do that. And so again, it's this commitment to, if you're gonna talk about it, you gotta bring them in as a full team member. This, this term, public-private partnership, it's like, I don't want a partnership, I want your skin in the game. I want you there. And a lot of people say, why is the private sector even interested in this? And it's like, it's a bottom line issue, folks. They also deal with the same challenges that we're dealing with. We oftentimes compete for the same resources. And so one of the things we're trying to do is, is ask a different question instead of asking the private sector what they're going to do for government is go, what can we do to get you open? And so that approach. The other thing is FEMA is schizophrenic in how we operate for years. And there's a few folks here who have been here for a while, Leo and some other folks, where we were regional based and then we were headquarters centric. Well, I always figured when you go shopping, I shouldn't have to travel to Washington to go shopping and get my questions answered. And FEMA had 10 regional structures, but we had migrated so much of the decision making to headquarters that for most states, the region was merely a speed bump day to day. They would just, they could, nobody could make a decision in regions, so you ended up going out there. So we took the positions that Congress gave us and you know, I've never been in an organization that ever says they have enough people, but we took positions, we took vacant positions that had not been filled, and we gave them to the regions. One of the things we never had before, and Ernie Abbott will appreciate this, we never had attorneys in the regions. Mm -hmm. uh, we now have a attorney assigned full-time in each region so that things don't have to come all the way up to the headquarters. We've placed uh, disability integration a lot of people talk about disabilities from a standpoint it's something well you got to comply with the ADA well no folks it's a civil right it's not an architectural issue and part of this is being inclusive if you don't have people there and you're planning and you're exercising it tends to be after the fact so we have disability integration specialists now that have been hired that are in the regions uh, we in this country mismatched the Stafford Act is very much state centric but we also have the issue of the sovereignty of the federally recognized tribes all right, so we never had dedicated positions in the regions. And so I couldn't get enough positions, so I split one private sector and tribal so that we at least have a point person in each region for the regional administrator to be a subject matter expert, both working with our private sector partners, but also on tribal issues. So this is moving from Washington centric to get out to the regions and really kind of the idea is headquarters is where we develop the rules and the tools, but the regions are where we implement. Because Mark should be able to go to Tony Russell and with rare exception, Tony Russell's the regional administrator in Region 6, get the answers and have, run, have a, a team there that's authorized to support Mark in that response without it defaulting to, it's got to go up and get a mother may I from headquarters. So just two kind of examples of we're not talking about it. We're not writing another policy guidance. We're not, you know, well, they are updating the strategic plan. But, I mean, we're like, if you don't put people in places and you don't start doing it, you just keep talking about it. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, what we have is we have a microphone. So when you come around, microphone comes to you. I'll call on you. We'll start right over here. Please state your name and affiliation if you have one, and then uh, go into the question. Go ahead. Hello, Ann Richard, International Rescue Committee. I'm curious to hear what you think the lessons learned were in terms of the U.S. government response to the earthquake in Haiti. And uh, my own sense was that one reason FEMA was involved so quickly was that um, the appointees at the top of USAID weren't really there yet, um, and Rasha just arrived. And so had there been people, they might have been able to explain that they do this sort of thing all the time, maybe not on the same scale. The other piece of the question is what you think of the need for an international response framework. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's pit the humanitarians against the responders. Um, <laughs> <coughs> boy, did I, did I learn a lot about I'm this. i FEMA, I'd like to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is kind of an interesting topic. First thing is, um, whether Raj had all his political appointees or not, most of the USAID's core capabilities was working with NGOs and grant programs. Part of the problem we had was the UN compound was destroyed, so a lot of the UN leadership and where you'd originally start from got devastated. We also had a situation, as the President pointed out, the United States has been able to uh, project our force across the world. 
Yet here we had a country next door to us that we were going to constrain ourselves through the traditional roles of response. And again, the president of Haiti had made it very clear to our president that he wanted our help. This was not a question about you know, country clearance or sovereignty of Haiti. The Haitian president said, I need your help. And so it really became the proximity of where the resources were coming from. And we're the United States. We had urban search and rescue teams. We had two of which are dual certified for international response and USAID, but we had additional teams. We had teams in Miami who actually could tap into their local fire departments and get Haitian uh, uh, Americans that actually know the country, know the language, and that could go down there. Uh, we had satellite communication capabilities. We had public information that we could staff them up with and provide them greater support. And the president made it very clear to all of the agencies that USAID was the lead, but we were all in in supporting this. And so I think it set, you know, again, this role that people said, well, this is really outside of FEMA's normal parameters. I'm like going, well, we, what were we doing? Coordinating search and rescue, uh, putting in communications to support those search and rescue teams, adding repeaters, doing public information. Gee, sounds like what we do anywhere. The fact that you know FEMA doesn't have a charter to go out of the country, of course not. We didn't do it by ourselves. We did it under the taskings from USAID. Uh, so for me, I think it's a lesson that probably within this Western Hemisphere, um, when these types of events occur, that the traditional response of grants and those programs, the fact that you actually have significant number of local and state response capabilities that could go, I think you may see more of that in this hemisphere. It doesn't really work well once you get out of this hemisphere just because of the cost of sending teams versus the proximity of the resources. Within the international community, in fact, uh, there's a pretty healthy debate going over in the EU right now about this. Uh, within those folks who believe there should be an international response outside of the humanitarian channels, uh, I will leave that debate to the State Department and the UN. If I am tasked, we are prepared to support. But that is a, it's a very lively debate upon the uh, response community, particularly the international uh, urban search and rescue and other teams, and the more traditional humanitarian. But I am focused on what we do here inside of this country, and if I'm asked and tasked by Raj to support him in the future, we are prepared to go. I mean, we essentially do what we do. All right, thank you. Let's, uh, somebody over, the gentleman right here raised his hand. And then we'll work our back way across there. Thank you. Uh, Leo Bosn, a retired FEMA. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, by the way. I almost wish I hadn't retired. Um, <laughs> oh, almost, almost. Um, I want to ask uh, Mr. Figge to comment on three issues that I saw as a FEMA employee during Hurricane Katrina that caused us real problems and ask what he's, what he's been doing. I'm sure he's been doing a lot to address generically issues like this. One was that we had really lost by 2005 a lot of our state and local connectivity and credibility, and it was hard for FEMA to work quickly by then, I think, with our partners. Uh, second was the issue of how do we work with Homeland Security. The Homeland Security people really, in my view, caused us a lot of problems during Katrina. I'd like to see how that's been worked out. <laughs> and then um, thirdly, the question of just how we address problems that get identified but never get fixed. There were I, problems identified in Hurricane Pam exercise a whole year before Katrina, but a year later they hadn't been fixed. So what you're doing to try to get on top of that. And thanks again. Um. Well, since I was one of them, they've reminded me time and time again, just because I'm up here in Washington, they know where I live. So the state directors and I have a very healthy dialogue. The one thing I can say that I appreciate, they don't blow smoke up mine, and I don't blow smoke up theirs. We have pretty frank conversations, and we'll disagree, but I think Mark can attest to this. Normally, at the, uh, the state directors would have a conference, and the uh, FEMA ministry would routinely fly in and fly out and speak 30 minutes and be gone. I try to be there, the conference. I try to make myself available. We have a closed door executive session, which is basically everything's on the table. We don't hold anything back and we don't script it. So I think that that relationship, I th the real challenge, Leo, isn't the existing state directors, it's how many new state directors we've had. And, you know, Mark's gone from being one of our rookies to being one of our more senior state emergency management directors in a relatively short period of time. So it's really, how do we pass on to the new state directors the lessons learned and the network that can support them? And so that's one challenge. Uh, the other challenge was how do we work with DHS? I just ignore all that stuff that was going on before I got here. Uh, Secretary Napolitano, uh, the DEPSEC, and I, we get along great. Congress basically said the FEMA administrator, one, is, is, a, is an elevated position. The position was upgraded to a level two executive. There's only 
uh, two other level two executives in DHS, the deputy secretary and the undersecretary for uh, management. Uh, the law says that I only report to the secretary, that it is illegal for me to report through anybody else. Uh, so that was a framework that we walked into. Uh, but then again, Secretary Napolitano was also a governor. She dealt with this from a governor's perspective. And, you know, there's a lot of people said, should FEMA be in or out of DHS? And I said, you know, really that debate should be over because Congress already has ruled on that. You got to focus on doing your job. And then there's this other term, uh, realizing my press guys freak out when I say this, called OPM. <laughs> other people's money. <laughs> FEMA doesn't have an Air Force, but the Coast Guard and CBP do. And one of the great things about being inside of DHS is we're able to leverage a lot of our capabilities. So again, when Admiral Allen, I mean, we don't fight oil spills, I don't really have that much stuff, but when he needed more people to help uh, get out uh, with community messaging, helping support public information, things like that, well, those are things we have. And so our ability within DHS to share those and work as a team, I think, really starts to show uh, some of the benefits of yeah, there was a lot of stuff that happened before, but I didn't start with that. I started with a new secretary, a new organization, um, focus on doing our job and trying to be a good team member. And that seems to have put a lot of that in the past. And you always got your little bureaucracies, but we even got that in FEMA. So it, that, I think, is normal. But I think some of the stuff that was going on before, we just started off going, we got a new secretary, we got clear direction and our authorities. Uh, we're going to function as a team. And then the last one is, a lot of times the exercises were so phony that if you learned the lessons, you basically learned the lessons to a bad Shakespearean play. Uh, so, I mean, it's sort of like state needs generator. FEMA says, okay, we got generators. Well, there's not indefinite generators. You know, some of the lessons from Pam you learned was that the federal government's going to do all this stuff. And it's like, you can't. So the easy answer a lot of times was just to say yes when the more practical answer was going, how do you prioritize that? Where is it coming from? Is this going to be something that the state would be faster sourcing privately and reimburse? I mean, this is the thing. Here's, a, here's This is how bad it got when I got to Florida. I actually thought FEMA had an ice maker. Because every time we had a hurricane, we ordered ice from FEMA. So my assumption was FEMA had an ice maker. Because <laughs> every time there's a disaster, we'd ask for food, water, and ice. So we get MREs, which weren't anything suitable for anybody under the age of 16 and you know, over 16 or under 80 was about the only people that could chow on those things, bottled water and ice. It turned out they were buying the ice from an ice maker in Jacksonville. They were buying it through a mission assignment through the Corps of Engineers, which was a 20% market for their overhead to have their ACE folks and everything they had to have in place. So essentially, we were buying ice from a Florida vendor to be shipped through FEMA systems with overhead to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to come to me, and then I still had to pay the 25% match. So I asked a question, why don't we just order the ice from the ice maker ourselves and get FEMA to reimburse us? It is an eligible cost. And so a lot of this was, again, as you go through these exercises, really going back and going, look, folks, bring up these issues. And we kind of backed off some of this stuff and said, there's a, par there's a hierarchy to what you got to get done. First thing is you got to be able to physically get back into the area of impact. So it doesn't matter what our plan says. If you cannot get into an area, I don't care how many generators you have on trucks, they're still not there. So, you know, again, can you get in there? Second thing, it's got to be safe. And this is really generally going to be where the governor's going to use their resources, their mutual aid for law enforcement, their National Guard. But again, if you lose that, even the perception that it's safe, what happens to all the other parts of the team that don't carry guns? They're, they're, they're stopped. The third thing is the search and rescue. And if we don't get to the injured, they don't get a timeout, they don't get a do-over. I mean, it's like, that's fine. And so you start moving through this hierarchy. And what you found with Pam was you're getting so far down into the event that you weren't focused in on, you may not be able to do generators. You may not be able to do food distribution if you still haven't got the resources to reestablish enough capability to make sure that it's a safe environment to operate in, that you are not diverting away from search and rescue. So we're moving back to a hierarchy of what we're calling a mom, a maximum maximum to plan against versus we're gonna to try to build a response out of pieces and hope we get there. We're defining an outcome with a time frame. And then we're not defining it as only what government can do or only what the federal government can do. We're really looking at who's got the best resources, who's got the core capabilities. And in some cases, some of those missions may be better served by actually tasking a contractor or turning to the private sector and asking a different question. If you can get your stores open, then I don't need trucks hauling 
food. I need to put those trucks now hauling generators to get to the wastewater treatment plant. So that, you know, part of what we're trying to do in our exercise is make them more realistic, make them less, make them not so much free, uh, free form is less scripted and actually get to the issues and then recognize there are no easy answers. And so part of this is having the state with the visibility and they're saying, we gotta make choices. And they're not gonna be popular choices, but they're, they're pragmatic based upon, this is what you can get done in the time frames. This is how much stuff's available. And this is who on the team's got the best solution. So we need to work to make sure that is what we're focused on. Great, thank you. Let's go to this uh, gentleman right here. And then we'll go back over to, to the gentleman over here. Hey, Craig. Oh. Mike Herman, how are you? Good. Um, a lot of this is Mike's fault, actually. <laughs> I'm not going to admit to that or deny it. <laughs> um, as you know, it's not a big surprise for, you, for me to, to say that I agree with you that emergency management is primarily state and local focus. And there's a lot that's tried to be done to focus on that. And we've also had a situation in the last, particularly since Katrina, and some could argue since 9-11, where in the last administration in particular, it was presumed that emergency management was really a federal function. Now we have this dilemma where we're in the tightest fiscal times we have in probably since the Great Depression. We have a constitutional and frankly statutory and operational recognition that emergency management is primarily a state and local responsibility, but there are lots of folks in Washington who still think it's a federal responsibility and lots of dollars in Washington. How can you create incentives or do things to really create the opportunities to put the capability back in state and local governments where the responsibility is, and frankly, as you point out, you can't get there as quickly as you need to. Well, again, I think it's, it's some of the things that um, longer term uh, is looking at some of the incentives that were built as pilot programs in the Stafford Act, one of which was I was very fond of, was just, a, just one of your most costly pieces of a disaster is debris management, debris removal, what we call Category A. Uh, there was a pilot program that was passed that for a certain period of time would provide that if states and locals developed enhanced mitigation or, or enhanced debris management plans, the cost share would not be 75-25, uh, it would go to 80-20. The thing about cost shares you need to understand is what Congress says in Stafford Act, the cost share shall not be less than 75% federal, 25% state and local. The states determine how they do their match with locals. Some do no match and the locals pay everything. Some split it, some pay it all, some do a variation. But what the Stafford Act says is the assistance shall not be less than 75%. We have a rule that says once you get to a, a high level of impact of uh, over $120, $130 per capita, total state population times 130, once you get to that cost, we will move the cost share to 90-10. But we've never really looked at using the Stafford Act as an incentive to provide a higher cost share based upon steps the state takes is to reduce the overall cost and contain cost. An example is if the governor will call out their guard, and again, most states don't have a reserve for disasters. They don't have a, a disaster uh, you know, response fund like we do with the DRF. So for them, it comes out of budget, it comes out of operating costs. But the reality is the difference between them calling out their guard or we getting a tasking that we end up tasking the DOD under a Title 10 is actually the cost is far greater than whatever the 25% match was. So trying to incentivize that where we can provide where there are disasters, if the states are doing more to contain costs and doing more of what they can do through their contracting and save us money, could you look at things like cost share? So these are some of the strategies. And if you look at the deficit, uh, 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 presidential deficit uh, commission, reduction commission, this is some of the things they're pointing out is the Stafford Act and the way declarations have occurred are really not driving that. What they're doing is they're serving as a, almost to a safety net at a very low level. So it's not really driving this incentive to increase capability at the state and local levels. And it's, it's actually getting into a, an area where it, is this gonna be sustainable? Uh, so again, I think if you look at the presidential budget recommendations for 11 and 12, one of the things that we're still funding, and it's an interesting program because of its history, is the emergency management uh, performance grant programs. Those programs got all the way back to civil defense, and it's one of the very few programs that ever funded positions. And it is constantly under attack and everything like that, but the, the, the cost savings, you know, because I'm kind of, you know, when I look at this, it's like, okay, why is this a good idea to pay for staff in state and local governments and what is inherently a state and local responsibility? Well, this is the one area that 
historically has been the least supported at the local level. But where you do have a program can significantly reduce your state and federal response costs. My experience in Florida was where I had strong county programs, my costs were pretty low. I just had to bring them stuff. But where they didn't have a strong program, I had to bring in management teams, a lot more capabilities, and that cost meant that until those teams were there, we were delayed in our response and our costs went higher. So it's, it's again, where do we make our strategic investments? You know, this term, how do you buy down risk? It's, kind of a hard thing to say when you're dealing with a variety of hazards, but if you can increase capability that you can show reduces the overall cost and reduces the frequency of how many times we end up having to task federal agencies to do something, then there are some savings. But it is, a, you know, in this fiscal environment, you know, here's the bottom line. You really want to get to the cost of disasters, start getting some incentive in there to really push building codes that are based upon the hazards of the states they're in and use that as leverage to get states to adopt stronger codes. Everybody says, well, you're going to price out the homes. It's a cost of living thing. You know, people can't afford houses. I had people in Florida that had homes built before the statewide unified building code that were bought affordable. They lost everything because they were upside down their mortgages, their insurance didn't do replacement cost, and their roofs were not able to withstand a category one hurricane while their neighbors whose home was built after the unified building code in the same price range selling in the same markets didn't lose their homes because the roof didn't blow off. So, you know, this is, you know, it isn't going to be easy, but the Stafford Act as itself is not the tool that's going to drive this unless we figure out how we can build incentives in there so that the states and the locals on the front end are actually responding more aggressively, reducing the overall cost, particularly when it comes to things like holding down cost on big ticket items like debris. Gentleman right over here. Hi, my name is Peter Hyde. I'm just an interested bystander, but um, rarely does that occur in this town. <laughs> <laughs> it's got good benefits. Stand by for anyway, the <laughs> uh, you mentioned in your remarks the importance of using the public as a resource. Yep. And I think that's a really important concept in resiliency of a society being able to recover after a disaster. Um, people want to be soldiers, not victims. And to some extent, it seems that with the ubiquitousness of social media, that offers a tool to coordinate the public in a way that we've never enjoyed in the past. And I was just curious to what extent FEMA is developing a strategy uh, through which you can coordinate people's movements, their uh, participation, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Well, I actually foresaw this. I was actually tweeting yesterday that the, uh, the biggest danger at FEMA now wasn't the creation of acronyms. It was new hashtags. And that at some point, a hashtag would be used in a presentation. So here it is. The hashtag in Twitter you want to follow is uh, pound sign SMEM. It's a rather lively debate going on among emergency managers of how social media can be used. But here's the caveat. You cannot use social media to control people or direct people. Uh, this is, again, if the lessons of the uh, unrest that's occurred overseas as well as our own experience in disasters. The, the trick is you have to figure out that you now have a tool you never had before, and that is we can now engage in a two-way conversation. But we cannot tell the public what, where to go, what to do. We can give them information. But you don't, this isn't a tool where it's like another way of broadcasting to them like over the radio or TV. This is actually where they often will determine, they actually determine which hashtags they're going to use or how they're going to talk about something. So it's a, it's a new era for us. And as somebody once, uh, some of the uh, emergency managers said, this is sort of like when radios got introduced. This is a way of communicating we've never had before. So it's starting to tear down some of the barriers between us. But here's the trick. There's no way for us to have a two-way conversation with millions and millions of people. But we can see what the issues are, what the concerns are, what they're hearing, what they're doing, and then respond to that and try to do a better job of addressing those issues or concerns. And so, uh, you know, we've been using things like uh, we did a joint project with uh, Tennessee and Tennessee Floods where we did a joint Facebook so that we could post. Uh, people were kind of surprised we let people post negative comments about the response there, feeling that we were going to censor that. And the only thing we were censoring was anything that was offensive to the general public. But if it was critical, fine. Uh, I'm trying to get my guys to blog and actually put information out there that don't read like press releases <laughs> and then allow people to comment about that. Um, and using Twitter as a dynamic tool, again, not as another tool to issue a 140-character press release but to put information out there and then see what people respond back to. And it's actually become something pretty fascinating within the emergency management world. It's actually breaking down and speeding up communication upon, 
emergency managers at all levels, uh, volunteer NGOs and, their, and government, about how fast this is emerging and changing and ideas and techniques that traditionally was limited to conferences and courses. So here's the joke. FEMA would like to innovate at something faster than the speed of government. And so we're looking at social media and other tools that we're not so much dictating it as we're followers trying to learn how the public uses these tools. And the reality, we need to fit how they use it, not make them fit how we operate. Graham, let's go ahead uh, to the uniform over here. Thanks, sir. Um, I Thanks have a question. Okay, get your, we have the mic and get your name and uh, affiliation, please. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Major Tom Lesnick from the Air Force. Uh, not representing the Air Force, just in the Air Force. A uh, question, uh, question about managing expectations and uh, speaking plainly. Obviously, you're a, you're a plain-spoken guy. Um, it seems as though there's a murkiness to every event immediately uh, following a disaster. There's an expectation we're going to go from uh, incident to recovery right away. And then emerges a, a leader who speaks clearly and forthrightly. Uh, what steps have you taken to talk to your regional officers about being forthright with the public so that they have an understanding of when recovery phase is going to take place? I, I hope I've uh, asked that question clearly. Um, it, it seems as though a, an Admiral Allen always emerges after confusion. A General Honore always emerges after confusion. How do we get that person up front right away? Because I truly feel as though populations embrace those characters and it helps uh, communities heal. Well, the person that would normally deploy into a state in that situation is a federal coordinating officer, and I've given clear instructions. The first one I see in front of the governor briefing, I shoot. Um, my message to my federal coordinating officers is pretty straightforward. As long as the Mark Cooper and his governor are getting things done and we haven't embarrassed the president, we've had a good day. And I think this is one of the things about making clear FEMA's in a supporting role. We're not, in the, we're not running the disaster. Also, as you say, we need to be clear about what we can and can't do. There's a lot of mythology about when people hear about individual assistance that we're going to make everybody whole. And the first thing I do is going, you can be made whole with $30,000 if we max out every piece of the programs and everything you can get, which is rare. You know what the average amount of money people get from FEMA in most disasters is? It's about $22 to $2,400. And the Tennessee floods is a little bit higher because of the flood damage, uh, but it was a little less than $8,000. And so... One of the things about it is with our regional administrator is building the team with the states and with the governors, particularly with new governors, making sure that we all understand what our programs can and can't do. And we find that the best advocates for this is the governors speaking to their citizens, explaining what they are doing, how FEMA is going to help, and what we can do. But it's also being clear not that we'll go in there and say we're going to fix everything, make everybody whole, everything's going back to normal. It's a disaster. All right? There were losses. People died. People's homes were destroyed. And again, the FEMA programs are not designed, nor was it the intention of Congress, that Stafford Act make communities whole and make people whole. It is a tool to start the process. There are other programs. There are other capabilities. But too many people have made the Stafford Act and FEMA central to that we have all the answers and all the funds. Quite honestly, in Tennessee, the folks that were in shelters, and Leo knows this, we would go into a disaster and put people in a FEMA housing program, all right? Our programs, statutorily and by rule, we go about 18 months, then we don't have any more capability to go. But if you're in a shelter after a flood, two weeks after it, you're not going to be a FEMA program for 18 months. You're going to have a long-term issue because you're not in a shelter two weeks after a flood because you've got options. So part of this is building a better team and coming in with a better program. Who's got the best program for those people displaced that have long-term housing needs they are going to need to be supported? It's HUD. So why wait 18 months? So one of the things we've been doing as part of the administration is building the team around who's got the best capabilities. And so we brought HUD with us into those shelters and began leasing people into the HUD housing program versus putting them into a FEMA program as an intermediate step because the reality was they needed a long-term housing solution, not a temporary solution. And so these are the type of things that you come back and, you know, people like to talk about managing expectations. I'm like, good luck. Um, <laughs> what you got to focus in on is what the needs are. There's a lot of wants out there, but there are certain essential needs you got to focus on. The first one is if the community isn't safe, you're not going to step two. If people don't have a place to live, you can't get jobs back. If the schools don't open, people aren't going to stay. 
So, you know, people would like to be held harmless. They want everything to be great. They want to look this. My theory in Florida was if you're complaining about how long the line is to get your free ice, it's a good day. You're breathing. You're alive. So this side of the room, anyone from over here? All right, right there. John Ether from Northcom. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the, uh, if there's any effort to revise HSPD-8 and to address some of the <coughs> Planning, uh, synchronization, and coordination problems of federal plans. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, national security staff have been working on that. That was one of the uh, early um, HSPDs they've been reviewing. It's in the interagency. It's actually now out in concurrence project with the process with the deputies. Uh, but again, as I've been known to do, is like that's I'm not waiting. Uh, we're charging ahead, focusing on using catastrophic. Is kind of a a benchmark to plan against to go if our systems don't work in that I've never seen anything scale up and work in a disaster so if you can work these issues and figure out how you deal with the big issues and those challenges then it's it, it's easier to scale down so we've been less focused a lot of people like to focus on scenarios but I was a paramedic uh, for a while and uh, I kind of asked this question so what kind of different paramedic do you need if it's a weapons of mass destruction versus a building collapse versus a flood I mean how many different kind of paramedics are there essentially you break it down into what you do and what you're trained to do and you may have some enhanced skills but the bottom line is you don't suddenly become something you're not and so when people are so focused on scenarios as driving it's almost like you need a whole different team it's like there is not a whole different team the whole thing about all hazards we use a lot in emergency management wasn't they're all the same but the mayor is the mayor it doesn't matter what happens what disaster whose authorities what federal entity is going to show up the mayor's the mayor the police chief's the police chief the superintendent schools superintendent schools and hey guess what when you really boil it down you're going to do inherently what you're trained to do. It may be more of one side or the other. There may be different agencies that have lead responsibilities. But guess what emergency management does? Who's got the best answer? Who's got the best team? Then our job is on behalf of our authority having jurisdiction to make sure we're all working to support that. One of the lessons I learned is when you got state veterinarians set up a command post, ordering up phone lines, and uh, setting up and trying to build out these things, that's that many more state veterinarians not focused on an animal disease outbreak. And once they figured out that we weren't coming in there to run their job, they realized that the emergency management team, we can support a state veterinarian dealing with an animal disease outbreak and help them with all of their logistical needs so that the state veterinarians could be state veterinarians and do the epi investigation instead of trying to figure out how to find billeting, rent cars, and uh, schedule uh, meetings. Let's go all, all the way in the back on the left side over here. Thank you, sir. Uh, Clyde Paris, Embassy of Barbados. Uh, sir, in your experience, the um, question of uh, security or security concerns or even, um, in my view, fear of uh, victims, uh, how has that impacted on, on your ability to, to operate uh, effectively? And, and, and can you cite um, you know, any, any examples to illustrate? Thank you. Yeah, the, the hurricanes that we ran into in 2004, um, really gave me an opportunity. I'd kind of been bubbling around with this since I became the state director, and we were dealing with the uh, uh, immediate aftermath of September 11th and the anthrax uh, attacks, which actually the first ones were at the AMI building down in Florida, and dealing with some of those things. And I began looking at what we had learned from Hurricane Andrew and applying it against the, uh, the recent attacks. And one of the things I began to really try to get across the team was we don't have time to assess. Every time we send people out to assess how bad it is, is less time we have to respond. And that's when I first said, why don't we just respond like it's bad? The traditional way we would do security is you'd wait till there was a problem, then you start calling out the guard and sending them there. I said, well, why don't we just send the guard there in the first place? Uh, I had a great general at that time, Adjutant General of the Florida Guard, Major General Burnett, and he coined the term presence is a mission. That if we wait for security to become an issue we lose control nor did it require us to have somebody on each street corner with a gun in many cases if you had a humvee or a sheriff's deputy or even a utility truck immediately in the area afterwards 
it reassured people. You, you really kind of come back to what people go through in the trauma of a disaster and how they are dealing with that. And the first thing they deal with is they're cut off. They have no communications. They don't know what's going on. And they oftentimes they only know what's around them as far as they can walk and as far as they can see. So this isolation tends to start driving a, a lot of the situations that people will allude to and say, well, it's looting and other things. Well, it's actually pretty much survival mechanisms. But if people see a presence of authority, A, it means they know they're not by themselves. Somebody got there, all right? Two, it reassures them that help is coming. And so we would, we would and with hurricanes coming in, which is something we could see, we would just deploy based upon it was going to be bad, and we would try to get in right behind the winds. And I had a lot of sheriffs in Florida who were quite angry at me because how dare I suggest they didn't have full control, and who was I to come into their county? And I'm like, look, here's the way it's going to work. They're going to show up. You want to get mad? Talk to my boss. He's the governor, and he actually has this authority. And, oh, by the way, your guys have been working their rear ends off, getting ready for the storm, evacuating. Wouldn't it be nice to get some relief in here so they don't have to go straight into directing traffic so they can check on their families? And, hey, if we're only going to be here a day or so, let us do some of the stuff to help you so your guys can take care of their families and then come back, and it's yours. We're not taking charge. Sheriff, you're in charge. But here's some help. And at first it was, a, it was a turf issue, but afterwards people got it. And it, we did not have, and again, I had areas that were subject to the things that you would have seen in Katrina, but on much smaller scales. It just didn't happen. You know, you get reports of looting, but it was very isolated. Um, but what we got time and time again, and this is something any governor that's been in the business will learn, one of the best things a governor can do to show people that they have seriously uh, committed to respond to this disaster is to see the guard got called out. And so you, you, sometimes you focus so much on, you know, the idea that if nobody's shooting and nothing's happening, you, you wait. It's, it's also a very psychologically powerful tool. And again, I, you know, Andre was right. You don't walk around with your guns pointed, all right? Just being there in uniform, just being there in the vehicles and being seen is really, for what we found, was what settled things down, and it, it actually started doing something a little bit more different in that once people saw them, people started coming out and realizing, I need to go do something. So they weren't just at their house, because a lot of people, they wouldn't even leave their property, but once they started seeing the guard and see the, the, uh, our Florida Highway Patrol and other sheriff's office, and we had really robust mutual aid and stuff going in, people then started getting back and leaving their homes, going back to their place of work, or going back and seeing how bad the school was damaged, and they started moving back into what are the things we need to get going to get on our feet again. They weren't holed up. And so, again, this is this tendency that we only bring out security when we lose it. It's basically, you've lost because it's going to take you a better part of three to four days in our experience to get control again. You're going to require vastly more forces than you had in the first place, and you escalate the risk, you're going to have to use deadly force, which, again, nothing's happening to you do that. So it's a different way of approaching it, particularly in the islands down there, is you guys get hit. People, again, if they don't see authority and they don't see hope and they, everything's pretty bad, they're going to start their own survival mechanisms, and then it gets kind of scary after that one that starts to break down and they don't see that government's got some control. So um, it's a way of looking at it. It's, it's not, it's again, it's not this thing where as emergency managers were always taught, you have to overwhelm the first level to go to the next level to go to the next level, what I call the domino theory of failure, um, which is what it usually turned out to. And if you wait until you know how bad it is, it's like we were really big on sending assessment teams in afterwards to survey the damages to report back up and go, do we need it? I just took the approach, you know, if you got a Category 3 hitting the coastline, it's probably bad, unless it's the King's Ranch in Texas, which apparently you can hit with a Category 4 and the cows just turn backwards to it. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, if you get a major earthquake, you know, you get a big hurricane coming in, I mean, really, how much assessment do you have to have to know you're going to need stuff? And there's always this risk. People want to be cost conscious. Look. There's people that accuse me of this. It's like I basically tell you, you can be fast, you can be cheaper, you can be accurate. Pick one. I don't run a disaster that way for seven months, but in the first 72 hours, it is a lot better to have too much. It's like I tell my guys, and for those of you that are recording this and members of Congress or your staffs that are seeing this, um, if I don't have enough stuff there fast enough, I'm going to get fired. If I have too much stuff, you're going to call a hearing. You pick. 
Well, on that note, um, <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> I was, I'm still back on the Cal reference. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, that's, uh, unfortunately, this is all, all the time we have to be respectful of, uh, of Mr. Fugate's time. Uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating um, uh, discussion, really enlightening, and appreciate you being so open and receptive to, to the question. So uh, thank you very much for taking some time out of your schedule. Thank you.